Hello again, everybody. This is Dan Clouser, and welcome back to the Journey of My Mother's Son podcast. Now I'm joined with fellow author Michaelia S. Cox. Michaelia, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Glad Absolutely. to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Always love getting together with uh, with other authors and kind of, you know, hear their story and find out how they, they find their own inspiration. Um, but before we get started, you know, just introduce yourself, you know, in your own words, who is Michaelia today? Well, um, that's a lot of words. No, I'm kidding. I'm being an author because I write lots of words. Um, I am Michaela S. Cox, and I'm an author and speaker. And I like to talk about what I've learned on my own journey in life of what I call from going from surviving to thriving. 38 Triple D, not what you think. Um, but it talks about the journey of being legally blind since birth, so a disability, lifelong disability. There's never been a day or will there be a day that I haven't taken a breath that I don't see through totally jacked up eyes, um, <laughs> which makes for a lovely combination cocktail of interestingness in its own right. And then in 2005, when I was 26, I found myself getting divorced. So that's the second D. And then I was lucky after that to find the love of my life. And we were together for 12 years. And then he tragically, unexpectedly, suddenly passed away in 2017, seven years ago. And I was 38. So disability, divorce, and death all by the age of 38. So it's taught me a lot. And I feel like I have a lot to share that I've learned. I don't know all the answers, but I can share through my writing the message that I have. I feel like I could help others to be empowered on their own journeys. Yeah, I love that. I love that. How long have you been writing? I really have been writing my whole life. I yeah. mean, I was always felt called to it, but what I've written in my adult life, you know, and what I publish now has probably been worked on you know since 2011 but I remember writing my first I was a little bit of a weird kid um <laughs> self-admittedly I decided I was upset about something in the second grade so that was like I don't know like 86 87 we were living in Texas at the time and yeah you know, I thought you know what they need to hear about my opinion on this matter because this just isn't right so I'm gonna write an editorial and let everyone know about how I don't think this is right I mean, what did I really know at six or seven or seven and eight? But I thought it was important. So whatever. Um, I was it was political, no doubt. It was a I think I think it was I think I heard in school that the Supreme Court was ruling on whether burning the flag should be considered part of the First Amendment's right. And in my little second grader mind, I just thought that was horrible. And I had to say something about it. So I wrote. <laughs> so <laughs> as weird as that may be for a second grader, that was kind of the beginning of my writing and understanding that words could have power, maybe impact or influence. And then I wrote my first poem in fourth grade. And then obviously what I wrote then I don't right now, or I hope not, or we're all in trouble, but um, I've always felt drawn to it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same here. I've been writing my entire life and, you know, it's just one of those things that, uh, you know, when, when you kind of have that, that gift, you, you absolutely want to want to use it when you, when you were younger, um, did you have, aspirations to become a published author or at what point in your life were you like you know i i actually want to be published i want my you know my word to become my legacy now i think when i was like before high school i always knew i wanted to write and i loved the written word and i wanted to share what i had to say but i didn't know how that worked professionally mm -hmm. in like a big world picture like outside of you know i'm just a kid trying to write my story or words but i remember being in high school and my English teacher that year showed me that you have a gift and this is what you could do with it. And so you might want to think about writing books and, and start learning that process and seeing where it takes me. So I think even though I knew I always wanted to write, the idea of an actual real life vision of what how that works in the real world of authoring and an author career and publishing and publication became more in my mind and understanding that better when I was in high school. Yeah. 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 For me, I don't. I don't know that when I was in high school, I I thought that I would become an author, but like, like you, you know, I always loved writing, um, loved writing essays and short stories and all that sort of stuff. And it probably wasn't until I was in my, my early thirties where I actually felt like, you know what, I, I want to write a book and become a, a published author. And then, um, kind of just, just went from there. So when, when you started to write your first book, what, what was your timetable from start to finish? That was a longer kind of long ball game because I started that in high school, actually, right about the time I had that English teacher. And it was a very different subject that I was writing. But part of the disability piece is I'm really good at academia and I work really hard to be good at academia, but with a vision impairment. 
of legal blindness, it takes a lot more work than most people realize. So when I'm in school, I don't really do anything else but school. That's pretty much all I have time for. So it's kind of one of those projects you, you, you know, you piddle with and you, you tinker at and you do a little bit here and you do a little bit here and you do a little bit here. And then eventually after years and years and years, you finally have written it. And then by that point I was getting separated and divorced when I wrote the last poem in that book. Cause I started with poetry and then life happened and I went to grad school and then I met my husband that would end up passing away and we moved to New Hampshire and we had kids and I went to grad school again and you know, all the things. So I didn't get to really turn my attention to it until I don't know, 2011. And that book that I had tinkered with since high school through 2004 was finally released um, through a, a self-publishing company called iUniverse, a hybrid that helps you self-publish, even though it's not how I publish now. And that was finally released. And then, of course, I had the brilliant idea of, hey, you have an eight-month-old kid. You need to go to grad school. And while you're in grad school, you need to have another kid and try and write a thesis while your kid is three years old and a four-month-old and not sleeping through the night. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if that was smart, but okay, I live to tell. And so when I was writing those, when I was in grad school for those five years with my master's and then grad certificate from 2011 to 2016, I didn't have time to write but I had this massive explosion of creativity and all these ideas and this would be amazing. And so I, I wrote them down and then I set them aside so I could do grad school. And then the summer I got done with grad school when my daughter uh, went into first grade, I traded nap time for grad school work in evenings and weekend time that used to take up grad school. I turned it into writing my first two or three books. And then um, while I was in the process of doing that, all hell broke loose in April, 2017. And so I had to take a step back for about a year till I got our lives back on track after losing my husband and figure out what now. And and then once that kind of, I could kind of get my head screwed on straight on, I don't want to say normal stuff, but more everyday things compared to, okay, you lost a husband, your kids don't have a dad anymore. You're the, all of a sudden in the blink of eye, you're a widow and you're a solo mom and you're moving across country and that whole nightmare. But anyway, and then I started writing again, all the ideas I had in grad school. So that's basically what my five and eventually will be seven series are based off on in various different topics. Yeah. I know really long answer to your question. <laughs> no, no, I, I love it. Cause my, my first book, it took me nine years to write. And then I originally published it in 2012 and then somewhere between there and, and 2021, I decided it probably wasn't finished. I ended up adding 10 chapters to it and republished it in, in 2021 so in yeah. essence, I always tell people it was really an 18 year project. So, you know, like the fact, <laughs> the fact that, you know, yours was, you know, uh, somewhat of a similar timeline and stuff is, uh, you know, is pretty cool. And I, and I, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, when I'm doing book signings and stuff, I, I get a lot of people tell me, oh, you know, I wish I could write. And I'm like, look, at the end of the day, like, just start writing, like, just, exactly. just start writing. And then, you know, when you get something that can be published take the next step but just start yeah. writing you know it's the so. main thing is being on paper and getting that rough draft done then you can figure out i don't know who said it but i heard a quote one time that the art to writing is um they said how do you write and said there was a a person that said it and said the art to writing is applying the ass to the seat yeah just down and do it yeah there's always no. going to be a million excuses of right now there's never going to be the right time the kids are quiet the house is quiet nobody's home everything's going my way it's not going to happen you're you're just finding reasons not to do it because that does not exist we don't live in perfection and so and as much as we love amazing creativity brainstorms that doesn't always come either so it's just you have to whether that's 30 minutes a day whether that's once a week that you say to heck with everyone as long as no one's bleeding or dying in the house isn't on fire this is my reading time leave me alone Y'all will be here when I come out from under the creativity. The dishes will still be in the sink. The laundry will eventually still be piling up. It can wait for you to give yourself whatever time works for your life at that time. Like I said, there were seasons where I didn't get to write very much um, from pretty much high school on until, you know, 2000, you know, once I got out of grad school, I had to pick at it. But then once I got out of grad school and then my kids were still young. And so I did it during nap time and evenings and on the weekend. But now, my kids are both older, they're not grown, but they're older. And so once my kids, both my kids were in school, which was, I don't know, 2018, 2019, I can write as much as I want any day I want. If I want Monday through Friday during the school year, I don't really write during the summer because I want to be present and be a mom. Now I do write some things, but not like I do during the school year. 
And if I need to take a day off, I take a day off. But usually what I do is I'll get the kids off to school during the school year. I'll maybe do my quiet time, some journaling, you know, maybe some exercise uh, to start my day. And then hopefully by, unless I have meetings, hopefully by nine or nine 30 central time, I'm on my, no later than 10, I'm on my keyboard and on my computer and I knock out two or three chapters or whatever I'm writing until my eyes say, you've lost your mind, woman. You're not making us do one more thing. Mm-hmm. You will stop for now. And then I'll go do some other stuff. And then I might do something in the evening. But that works for what my, the season and phase in life that I'm at right now works. And so we all live different lives. We all have different life journeys and we're all in different seasons and phases. So that may not work for someone right now. It may be, I go to, maybe they go to a coffee shop once a week and write for two hours, whatever that is right. for you, just do it. And then right. as life changes, you can add more do list or shift it. It doesn't have to be what you do now is forever. It's just finding a way that makes it work for you to write right now. If you really want to write, anyone can do it. You just have to decide you want it and and be disciplined and dedicated to it. Yeah. I love it. And I I love that concept for sure. So, you know, tell me a little bit about, um, you know, some of the things in your life, um, some of these, you know, what you want to call them setbacks or, or tragedies or, um, you know, whatever term you want to use, um, what was it that, that got you through, um, you know, each one of those and and how did that relate to your writing as well? Well, it relates in a couple of different ways. One, there's an expression in our society, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. Where I saw another quote by someone doesn't, what doesn't kill you gives you something to write about. Lord knows I got plenty to write about. Okay. (laughs) I'm going to be writing forever. So that's you know there's that and then also in having to be so dedicated to being determined to not let your disability stop you I don't quit I don't give up and you know I don't usually tell me no means I'm pretty much going to be hell-bent on doing it so there's that I mean being I don't know what your audience will be able to see from this video but being what I call a redhead Texas Southern Scorpio girl yeah I live up to that reputation and so I'm pretty (laughs) determined so yeah good luck in telling me now so that probably means I'm going to do it. And so just like I've had to be very determined and persistent and persevere and dedicated and diligent in life and and had endurance and resilience, that applies to not just the craft of writing as far as how you're disciplined and dedicated to what you want to write. And by the way, I'm a strong believer that if you're given a message and a story to tell that you're meant to share with the world, it's not going to leave you alone until you do it. So it's going to keep nagging you and nagging you and nagging you because it wants to be let out. It was given to you for a reason and for a purpose, and it's probably to help someone else. So you may not think it matters, but I guarantee you it probably matters and could help someone else. So you have to write the story or the message you were given, in my opinion, for what it's worth. But yeah. um, so the the learned, hard-taught ability to be resilient and persistent and persevere and dedicated allows me to see a project through and be dedicated to it. So that's part of the puzzle. But the other part of the puzzle and I talk about this a lot in Finding Grace Through Grief, which are the books that I just launched in April. I talk about what it took. I can't tell someone how to walk their journey of grief, but I can tell them what it is to get through it. Because while I write it in the context of grief, it really applies to all of life. Because this is answering your question, I promise. Um, it's the overcoming is overcoming is overcoming. I don't care if it's a medical issue. I don't care if it's a financial issue. I don't care if it's a a bad marriage, a relationship, a bad childhood, whatever. And granted, what I've been through, other people haven't been through and and what they've been through, I haven't been through. But the idea of overcoming and pushing through obstacles is the same no matter what that obstacle is. Now that various different obstacles, depending on it, may have different aspects to it or idiosyncrasies or twerks, quirks to it that I may have never experienced or, and they may never experience the ones with mine, but if you choose to be a survivor, a thriver and not just a survivor or a victor versus a victim and your own hero, you will have to learn the five things I'm fixing to talk about that I learned in an early child with the disabilities that I didn't really call it that at the time. You just did what you knew to do best and you just went on about it. And then kind of like with our body, when you've done something once, no matter how hard it is, I'm not saying it's any less easy or simple or not complicated, but you're like, oh, okay, I've done that before. So you just apply it to a different obstacle. And then when I lost my husband, even though I'm still applying them, I'm like, oh, I may not have never done this before, which I literally feel like that could be a title, but I've never done this before the last seven years, exclamation, underlined bold. Um, 
but I know what it is to keep working through an obstacle. Does that make sense? So I can't tell anyone, this is what you need yeah. to do, but I know how to show you how to get through it. And that would apply to anybody. So some of the biggest things that I had to do as a kid, I did when I was an adult with a divorce and a bad marriage, and I'm doing it again now. And it works to explain to finding grace through grief of the G, the R, the A, the C, and the E, and they all work together. And one of the things, I don't know your background, I don't know your audience background, but I'm definitely a believer um, in Christianity and in my personal relationship with my Lord Jesus Christ. So part of that for me in finding my grounding in life is my faith and then relying on friends or whatever your belief system is. We have to have something for me, it would be Christianity and that's fine for me. And I, I would like to think that's good for a lot of other people too, but it may be another belief system or type of faith or the point is you have to have some idea, some belief, some faith that grounds you and going, why am I still here? What the hell am I doing? Yeah. Like, what am I doing? Why am I still here if I'm going through all this? And it has to ground you for when it, the, the tough gets going and the rough gets going to make you want to keep pushing through. So that's part of it. So it would be my faith for me and my friends. Okay. Um, my beliefs in that I never give up. I never stop. I don't quit. I'm going to make this happen. Um, my husband that passed away was in the military and he said, basically it's the expression of hold my beer and sit back and watch. <laughs> maybe if you, it's a glass of wine, maybe it's the orange juice for the kids. I don't know, but whatever that beverage is, they can hold that cup and sit back and watch me go. Cause I'm going to do it. Um, the R would be choosing that when your world is getting turned upside down, you may not have been chosen the hand that you were dealt, like my disability. I didn't choose to be born blind or be legally blind my whole life. I did walk away from my first marriage, but I did not choose his decisions that made that marriage no longer doable, viable, whatever you want to call it, tenable. And I definitely didn't choose to have my love of my life pass away or my two young children at six to three in 2017 lose their father. But we do get to choose what we do with that. And we can choose whether to be defined by our circumstances or to define it for ourselves and have the guts to dare, no matter how hard it is, to chart our own course and say, you know what, this is may not what I asked for. And this really sucks. But now I get to choose what I want to do with it. And I'm going to make it what I want. And do you yeah. see the process it takes? And then I say learn and live to an abundance, which is the A of grace is, yes, that can be finances, but I'm talking about your mindset. And I think mindset sometimes is harder than the choice because you make the choice all day going long. But if you get distracted by all the emotional or, or mental entanglements, which can be needed to be had and need to work through. But at some point you have to say, okay, I am feeling this. And yes, it's okay to feel this. And yes, I'm processing this and I want to get better. But I need to have the mindset that's going to be the game changer. Because like we say in our society, if you put your mind to it, you can do it. And if you don't, you won't. Anything you put your mind to, you can do. So you need a good, healthy, strong mindset to help you to keep wanting to make those choices, to stay true to what you want in life and what's grounding you. And then the C is we have to take care of ourselves so that we can be in the good, healthy mindset to keep us on track, to make the choices we want to stay grounded. And then the last one is E of equip. Sometimes we have to raise our hand and say, hey, I need to find out some information so I I can keep doing these things. I mean, we teach our kids and, or we help we teach our kids in school that it's okay to be curious. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay that you don't know the answer, ask. That's how you learn. That's how you figure things out. So sometimes we all need things in life to do that next thing to help us get to the next thing that's gonna allow us to keep doing what we're doing. And so I did those things when I was a kid. I'm doing them, I've done them as an adult. I've been doing them as an adult and I keep having to do them as an adult. And that's what I think it takes to overcome anything, no matter what that particular obstacle someone may be encountering and facing and needing to overcome. And like I say, um, if you can't move the mountain, then find a way to over it, under it or something. I love that. I love that. And I, and I love you know, the part that you said about, you know, we don't choose what happens to us in life, but we can, we always have a choice of how, to, how we react to it. You know, yep. um, bad, bad things happen to all of us. It's just a matter of what decisions we make to get through those bad things. And even, you know, when you're talking about grief, I mean, grief is one of those things that you never really get over. You're always just kind of evolving through it and, you know, adapting to whatever your new normal becomes. And and today's new normal is going to be different than tomorrow's new normal. And, you know, tomorrow's new normal will be different than the next day's new normal. Um, but it's just something that you're constantly evolving through. Um, because you never really do overcome grief. It's just something that you deal with throughout your, your life. 
I mean, honestly, yesterday was horrible because it's Memorial Day. It's like one of the worst days of the year for me. So I just chilled out with my kids, did whatever I take to make it a reasonable, decent day. And then like, okay, I'm going to get up tomorrow and do the next thing and do what I got to do. Yep. Yep. Put it away and bring it back out when I need to. And then like, that's the one thing we, there's no guarantees in life, but that's the one thing we can count on. There's always constant change. Yes, there is. There's no and doubt there's about that. Constant choices. Like sometimes people, well, I don't want to make a choice. Well, by you choose. By you saying you don't want to make a choice, you are making a choice. It's still your life's direction is a direct result of the cho chain of choices you strung together to take you one way or if you made a different string of choices down a different path. So yeah. you're choosing whether you want to or not. And the other thing about it is I don't care who you are. And to think that you won't is, no offense, delusional and you're in denial. We are all going to get out of life where we've been through something. There's no getting out of this life without going through something. It's impossible. Right. Um, it's just a question of when and what kind, how many, and to what degree. Yep. So would you rather have to like stare at it in like a deer in the headlights and be frozen and not knowing what the crap you're doing? Or would you rather drown in it? Or would you rather be equipped and know the things in place to have so that whatever it takes to get through it, you know how to get through it? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, because it, it really is. I mean, that is just part of living is dealing with the bad stuff. You know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's mountains and valleys is what life's all about. You know, you're not going to be on that high mountain all the time. Sometimes you're going to get in that valley and it's just a matter of, you know, working yourself back up to the the mountaintop and then know that there's somewhere down the road, there's going to be another valley in, in front of you, you know? So it's just a matter of, you know, embracing that journey and, and putting one foot in front of the other and, and continuing to, to move forward for sure. So, um, Kelly, is there anything that we, uh, that we missed that you think would be important for our listeners before we start to wrap things up? As far as authoring or just in life, what I would say to the audience or as an author, because those are similar, but they're different. Um, you, you choose either one. I think as an author, it comes down to, if you value the message and you know, you're supposed to tell, give it to the world, don't be shy. It was in you for a reason. So be, never be afraid to tell your story and own it and share your voice with the world and echo it out to help someone else along the way. As far as a traveler of life, I would say that we get one shot at this life. There's no guarantees. There's no promises except for change. <laughs> the constant, but other than that, there's no guarantees. There's no promises. So I would tell you to choose well and to give it your best shot so that you can travel your journey your way and know that you're living the best life possible and you'll thrive in it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And just one thing I want to kind of add to what you said as far as writing. You know, I heard someone once say that, you know, creativity, um, so many people get caught up in worrying about if something that, if others are going to like something that they create. And at the end of the day, I think we as creatives um, are creating things for ourselves. I mean, like for me, writing is therapeutic, you know, uh, one, you know, going back to grief. I mean, one of the ways I deal best with grief or loss is writing about it. And I, I, I throw it out there to the world, not necessarily saying, Oh, I hope people love what I wrote. It was written for me first and foremost. And yes. if I throw it out there and it happens to help someone else going through a difficult time, that's oh. all the better. But at the end of the day, I think we need to get in this and with social media, like it's so tough because everybody's chasing likes and oh, yeah. follows and shares and all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day as creatives, I think we need to create for ourselves first and foremost. And then anything that comes beyond that is just icing on the cake and is, is just a benefit. But like you said, I think if you do that, it'll be more, it'll ring more true and authentic and organic. Yes. And that actually reaches people better instead of you trying to make it fit something it's your voice. It's your story and you're unique. We're all unique. So it's not going to be the same. And I believe that the ones that it's supposed to find or are supposed to find your stuff, they will. Yeah, I agree. I love that. I love that. So stay true to your voice and don't let anyone tell you it's your story. You get to own it and make it be what you want because it's yours and only yours. And you only have one story. And while there's similar themes and ideas in the world, nothing in you understand. It's never going to be quite the same as mine or mine's yours or whatever and that there's a purpose in that it would be boring for one thing but then that means somebody can always be reached by somebody else because it'll relate in a way that if i tried to tell someone else's story it wouldn't work anymore if they tried to tell mine right right i love that Michaela, how do people find you on the internet if they want to reach out to you 
um, find your books, um, engage you in speaking or anything like that? How do they find you on the internet? I have a website with my author website and my heartfeltmeditations.com. But then also all of my books are on Amazon. My I think I'm up to 14 now. And I have a whole bunch more I'm working. I'm always working on something. I'm never not just not doing anything or one thing. Um, and I'm almost done for 2024 as far as writing. And I'm going to start writing for 2025 because I have six series I'm building up. But um, so all my books are on Amazon, my website, heartfeltmeditations.com. And then I have my TEDx talk that's out. It's called Thriving, Open the Door and Leave Survival Behind. I love it. I love it. So, Michaela, that brings us to our final question. As you know, the subtitle of the podcast is Many Little People in Many Little Places, which comes from the opening lyrics of a Michael Fronte song, Gloria, which go, when many little people in many little places do many little things and the whole world changes. What's one of the little things that you do on a daily basis to make the world a little bit better place? I do a couple of things because it sounds selfish, but self-care is so important. When we take care of us, we can be the best version of us so that we are able to give the world and our loved ones the best version of us to help them be their best to make the difference. And I've been writing a book. Well, it's already written. It'll be out in June. It's based based, but it talks about the ripple effect. Mm. If I do something and it can affect someone else, then it may affect the pond next to me that might affect the church pond or the whatever group you're talking about pond that could eventually affect a city that could eventually. So then you're creating this influential wave of difference because you drop one thing in the pond, whether that was an act of kindness, whether, and you never know where it might go. You know, maybe it's we as parents, for anyone who's in the audience, our main job is to raise good humans so that when they grow up, they're able to raise good humans and eventually maybe affect the world. Yeah. I love that. It's I love that. Thing, but sometimes just enough right one things or the right one person. There is, yes, there are power in numbers, but there's equally a power in an individual and that right one person or that right one thing at the right time used in the right way or collectively individuals coming together can create this powerhouse of a major impact and create this ripple effect that could be the difference all of a sudden. Yeah, I love that. And I love that you talk about the ripple effects. That's something I talk about quite often is, is just that that incredible ripple effect that we can put out there in the world. And and like you said, it's just one little thing, but that can go on for forever and ever. So I, I, I love that you, uh, you use that angle as well. So um, Kelly, I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You no, know, I'm just saying it can be in the big, small things or the big things. And it can be whatever your gifts and talents are, find what you're passionate about and put it out there and use it for good and see where it takes you. Yeah. I love that. It I happens that. to be writing and speaking. So there you go. I'm I'm literally doing what I'm talking about. There you go. There you go. I love it. Mikhail, I really love uh, having this conversation. It was great yes. um, sharing your story. Um, I, uh, I wish you the best of luck in your future writing endeavors and speaking and everything else that you're doing. For folks out there listening, be sure to check out my other podcasts and blogs at journeymymotherson.com. While you're there, please check out the new Pay It Forward program uh, where you can purchase one of my books and have it donated to uh, a library or a book exchange or anything like that. And it's just a way to, to kind of spread that kindness and uh, put that uh, positive stories out there in the world. So again, Mikkel, you really appreciate your time. And uh, again, wish you the best of luck. You bet.